Hello, good morning. Welcome to Sunrise. It is this Monday morning. I'm Chamberlain. So, bright and cheery, right? Good morning and welcome. Today is September 4. I'm Ayo Makinde. Welcome to the program. Well, yes, indeed. Uh, a lot uh, going on, but it turns out that um, some bad eggs in the police force appear to be giving the police a very, very bad name. And uh, this has come up time and again. And that is why, uh, I mean, there's been several attempts to ensure that this kind of behavior is stamped out in the Nigerian police. But um, at the moment, it just keeps rearing its head. So um, over the weekend, uh, images again appeared, uh, one in Owerri and then the, the other, which you, you'll get to see. So uh, it turns out, but incidentally, um, Owerri and Rivers, yeah, and the one in Owerri where the policeman was just clearly harassing and uh, assaulting a citizen and all kinds of narratives and kinds of words. And then the one in Rivers too, which you equally get to see where a policeman brutalized uh, a citizen. And this kind of thing tends to talk at the heart of training, recruitment, the ethos of the police, meaning that there'll be several questions concerning how the kind of trainings that the policemen get from uh, the academy and then get into the force, which is why uh, inspector generals, support inspector generals, uh, they grapple with these kind of things. And the kind of recruitment process, the kind of people that get into the force, because uh, this also comes up wherein if politicians keep allowing, just keep chunking people into those areas, chances are that they just feel they'll be beholden to those quote-unquote authority to disregarding the law to a very large extent. But some of these images, uh, which all over the place online uh, over the weekend, eventually, actually, the one in Owari was summoned by the Inspector General of Police, and so many will expect that um, proper disciplinary action will be meted out to such person. And then the one in Rivers, the, the police authorities say they've seen this video, and so they investigated the matter. Uh, but they are also quick to let the citizens know that you can't actually get across to them when this kind of matter. So uh, it's going to be very, very instructive for the police to be sure that they rein in these kinds of people. And it wasn't long ago, by the way, where the acting inspector general of police did tell us that um, he was ready to not just hit the ground running, but to ensure that things are done right. Let's just serve you a reminder of what he said upon assumption of office. Now I have just been decorated, and I'm looking forward to taking over tomorrow morning by 11 a.m. I really can't describe how I feel presently, but if I have to tell you anything, I will tell you that right now, I feel like a tiger inside of me, ready to chase away all the criminals in Nigeria. And some other time, I feel like a lion in me, ready to defer all the enemies, internal enemies of Nigeria. That's my feeling right now. Thank you. A tiger, a lion. Well, I'm hoping that the police would also look at the logo of the Nigeria police, which is an elephant. Is it one that is going to uh, literally crush the criminals on the foot or the one that is too slow to move? Um, sad to say, really, as Chamberlain has said, just some bad eggs, literally giving the entire system a very bad name. Not a pleasant sight, no doubt about it. Um, Chum Chamberlain, one of the things that usually comes to my mind when I look at the, the activities of some of our security operatives and law enforcement officials is that they don't f remember the importance or the significance, the meaning of putting on the uniform and doing anything. It is not you, the policeman, that people respect. It is what you represent. You represent the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I think, as Chamberlain, as you have m mentioned, in training, let that be, I have never been to any police training, but let that be the strong point. Nigerians don't fear you as an individual. They respect the uniform 
that you represent. They represent, you represent the constitution. You literally represent the president of the country. In any part of the country that you are, that's what you represent. People are not afraid of who you are. Even if you have a gun, a mob action will definitely get to, to anyone. And it's, yes, I mean, we know it's something that happens all over the world. But not since 2020, for God's sake. Not since NSARS. Not since all of those issues. Much of which was always about the people themselves, the Nigeria police, the welfare of the police. We know that these things are there. But can someone please call every policeman, every soldier, every representative of a state or federal government agency that Nigerians do not fear you or respect you? Nigerians fear and respect the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the coat of arms of the country. That is what you represent. That is what you go out every day to service. That is what you are projecting, and that's what people fear. So when people see you behaving below par, it most certainly is hugely embarrassing, hugely shameful, and very, very unexpected. Look at this situation on our hands. I mean, I, I don't, sometimes I don't, I find it difficult, Chamberlain, to, to put words into how these kind of things will happen. Well, some will call it jungle justice, some whatever it is that we're going to call it, and their what they call the SOP, standard operating procedures. Do we also say that the police is subjected to jungle justice? You have faces, you have families, you have wives, you have husbands, you have children as well. If Nigeria is going to get any greater, it's a collaborative work. So, yes. Glad to know that the IGP has lent his voice and is making an attempt to do something. Can we begin to feel the impact of those animals that are raring to go in the heart and, and mind of the IGP now so Nigerians can have that confidence again? The second thing that I'd like to say about that, Chamberlain, is the need for collaboration with the states, not just on paper, not just in theory, not just in, in, in uh, what they call gentleman's agreement or understanding, but in actual action, where the federal government and the state governments are actually seen to collaborate in ensuring that these things do not happen. A situation where the governor of a state, who we call the chief security officer of a state, has to wait for a memo from Abuja, how many kilometers away, just before a constable could be disciplined. Sometimes it calls for caution. And it's, I don't even know the words to use here, so please, uh, let's revisit that logo again. I prefer the ones that the IGP said was rearing in his head. Can we put that on the logo as well? And let's have quick action. And let's have some real collaborative work that will instill confidence between the people and the police. That and many others, Chamberlain. Well, yes, indeed. Uh, and as a matter of fact, if you actually listen to uh, the police officer, the inspector of police who was caught in on camera, on tape, in uh, where how he was, he was just shocking, and it tells you where the where that policeman's, you know, where his head is, uh, what he's about, because when you hear wh what he was talking about, because eventually when he got to the IGP's office in that other images, which was also uh, the force public relations officer, you see him standing there, just uh, they played back his video for him to see in that particular clip. So uh, he's now, uh, the first public relations officer says he's been handed over to the provost marshal for necessary disciplinary action. Uh, not this one. This one is in reverse. This is not OA. So the one in OA was just a separate scenario entirely, which eventually you also got to see that one there. So we're looking to see how that eventually is addressed. All right, so uh, we'll go ahead now and take a moment and we'll be back with you with a look at some of the dailies in a moment. Let's begin the papers with this Nigeria today and what do we have on its front page? It's literally talking about governance and that's it right there. LG funds disburse resources directly to third tier of government. 
CSOs, lawyers, charge FG, berate governors. Diversion of ecological funds, crime against humanity, says Falanat stories on page two. Of course, we talked about this uh, time and again. We also had conversations around this uh, last week, and um, we know where uh, this could be coming from. That attempt that was made by the federal government in the previous administration to ensure com uh, you know, uh, that the states do the needful in this regard. Of course, we know and we understand the the opposition to all of those but hey that's what you have on the front page now so how will this happen um, are we saying that there's going to be another constitutional amendment so that uh, account that the states and the local governments share is uh, discombobulated or what i guess we'll wait to see that story you'll find the details on the inside pages right under that picture on the front page uk granted 132,000 visas to nigerians in first half of 2023 that's according to the envoy whoa okay that story is on page four. Find the details on the inside pages. Right beside the nameplate, Nigeria's active mobile subscriptions rise to 220.5 million in July 2023. 220.5 million active phone lines. Interesting. How many do you have, by the way? That's uh, this Nigeria this morning. Abuja Inquirer today, and uh, they are leading with the second runway matter. You know, it, it, there was a lot of back and forth. And actually, look at what he says here. Um, how Wiki resolved 15-year tussle. That's how long it's, it's taking at the moment. And so you just get to see uh, what this is talking about here today. And then... FCDA kicks over compensation. A lot of money has actually been voted for this. So if FCDA is kicking over this compensation, you may want to find out why um, that is the case. So, uh, but it's all here for you to just uh, go ahead and take a look at that. Yeah, they've got um, several other areas, but subsidy removal, transportation, food supply, top FCTA intervention, a lot of focus as well on what are states doing? What templates do they have you know, upon which uh, they can ensure that residents and, and citizens in their state get these palliatives? Because if it's just to distribute what, rice and oil and beans, okay, I wonder what the thinking is. But see, if that is done once, it's gone. What next? Perhaps they'll have more answers than we do know at the moment because it's thought was basic that everybody knows now but maybe there are so many things that we don't know yet so we'll keep tabs on that that's a budget car today this for this morning is uh, looking at cyber crime as uh its lead story and what does it say on the front page of the guardian newspaper cyber criminals exploit weak regulations to harvest data and defraud nigerians that is definitely concerning um, what's happening to this whole conversation about uh, harmonization of our data system centralizing the data ensuring uh, cyber security and all those things well let's hope that the, the story on page six will give you the details and look at the avenues uh, through which uh, your data uh, being harvested through POS terminals, through online transactions, through betting sites, through debit cards, through phone apps. Oh dear. Well, that's it right there. The details are on the inside pages. NLC insists on strike despite government's overtures as new tax regime commences. Find that also on page six. I find this one interesting on page three. FG gives ultimatum to illegal miners, targets 50% GDP contribution. Now, why is this interesting to me? Um, as at last year, I think uh, towards the end of last year, the value of solid minerals underground in Nigeria 
is put in the region of hundreds of trillions of naira hundreds of trillions of naira that's the value of what is buried under the earth in nigeria and um, as at that time from information available we're not even harvesting up to we're not contributing up to one percent uh, to the gdp from solid minerals in the country so when the um federal government is giving this ultimatum one of the questions that i'm and saying look you have 30 days uh, for god's sake I, I was looking into that story and looking for where states have a role to play so far it doesn't look like there is any decisive uh, position or role for states to play i would have thought that's uh, one way to go because hey the authority of the land is with the governor of the state but the things under the ground is with the federal government so shouldn't there be some kind of collaboration well that i hope is something that the minister of solid minerals will be looking at right under the nameplate hiking fees fresh worry over dropouts out of school children the understanding we have is that uh, the uh, school uh, student loan program will kick off this month let's hope that will stave off this uh, fresh worry over dropouts and out of school children that story by the way is on page four of the guardian newspaper that's the paper today uh then daily times is next here this morning palliatives distribution adama residents slam fintiri so you may want to find out why this is the case this morning but look at the writers i think you may just uh, shine some light on that alleged fraud in rebranding foodstuff with photograph inscriptions accuse him of vendetta opposition parties supporters okay i'll go good on that one opposition parties supporters totally starved mums the word from state government and these are the things you don't even want to crop up you never want to hear that this is the kind of consideration that informs this distribution of palliatives because it will be appalling and beyond the impact or the essence the meaning of that word really because the thing is if you go ahead and do this you're only going to stoke a lot more problems just for yourself and for the government across the board at large because you will have an army of disgruntled people if every state were to go this way you have an army of disgruntled people who are feeling the economic crunch and there's no holding back of such people if this were the case if this really that's a conditional if we're hoping that that's not because if by any chance those who they've given to distribute all of this are going this way then they need to step in and be sure they investigate properly and ensure that the right things are done the economic crunch knows no political party hunger knows no affiliation so they need to ensure that this the economy they're supposed to fix it for all. So I'm hoping that um, this will not be the case. And then you see at the bottom strip how Emifile messed up in Nigeria's economy. People will suffer many more years. That's a quote, some, uh, I think it's part of the story. So you may need to put that in proper context when you do take a look at that. That's Daily Times today. Talking about dailies, look at daily trust this morning, and it is speaking perhaps in the same uh, sphere as the Daily Times newspaper this morning. But look at it uh, on the front page 2022 flooding. Farmers decry expulsion from 1.5 billion naira relief materials. Uh, again, uh, going back to that statement and the, the comments Chamberlain made, um, let's investigate and be sure that these things are not real, particularly in the light of what the president declared uh, when he was talking about um, uh, uh, food security uh, when he declared an emergency on food security in the country. And then this, look at the writers, who identified beneficiaries through SEMAS. 
state emergency management agencies that's according to the national emergency management agency so um, you see the similarity between the two stories on the front page of the daily times and on the front front page of the daily trust but then right under that uh, the second rider farmers need flood resistant seeds that's another conversation altogether but you find the details of all of that on page four of the daily trust newspaper this morning right under that uh, nameplate military kicks as PSE wants police to lead terrorism war um, okay uh, you know we keep talking about collaboration with the agencies but then hey that's where we have now and let's just hope and pray that this doesn't degenerate into anything horrible and uh, on the far right, right under the word trust, experts differ as FG celebrates 400 days of zero grid collapse. Something to cheer? That's the Daily Trust newspaper today. Leadership next. Uh, so this is something I think, okay, let's see how, what it reads. At Leadership Twitter Spaces, Gabonese Junta are out to protect Bongo's interest. Stakeholders reveal you may need to get a lot more on this one. Uh, Africa must think outside the box to address schools terrorism. Ascribed to Sandy. I don't know who that is, but you know, check it. Africa still faces serious political conflicts. Ascribed to the AU. Um, then the question is, so are they in the? Do they have the capacity, the AU now, to address all of this? Of course, there'll be questions about all of that. Wait a minute. That that picture you see right there, guys. Uh, let me just read the title. A suspect arrested with ephedrine, skunk, and nitrous oxide, that's laughing gas, concealed in, wait for that, semovita packs and dry pepper for exports to South Africa and Kenya at the Muratala Mohammed International Airport, Lagos, at the weekend. So that's how the paper so captions that one. So, oh boy. And so just all sorts of things you get to see now. And then the authorities just have to keep pumping them up when they do some of this and encourage them to do a lot more. Of course, internal processes should be strengthened such that um, you know you don't get the kind of wrong stories we hear previously of stray bullets and which, anyways, we're waiting for NDLEA's investigation on some of those matters. As a matter of fact. Uh, one trillion naira anchor borrowers loan. Rice farmers seek presidency's intervention. You may want to find out. Okay, why do they need intervention? If they already access the loan, have they access the loan? What are the conditions? Maybe that's why they want you to read it. That is leadership this morning. Nigerian News Direct uh, has this on its front page. FG targets 50% GDP contribution from solid minerals. Stories on page two to review Mining Act, establish mines police. I remember we hinted at this last week as well. You know, that we have a mining police, but then, hey, that's what we're, we, we're, we're having now. I guess we're gonna see how that's gonna operate. Issues 40-day ultimatum to illegal issues 30-day ultimatum, make a pardon, to illegal miners. Find the details on page two. Enough said about that one. Right above the nameplate, African countries to pay $56 billion more on debt raised on capital markets, according to research. The details of that you'll find on page 21 of the Nigerian News Direct this morning. Now, this uh, uh, human angle story that broke over the weekend and it's since attracted the uh, attention of the governor of Lagos State, medical bill payments, someone who gives hope to 13-year-old with missing intestine. I, I, I can't even wrap my head around, you know, how that will happen in the first place. But, oh my God, the, the, the story is on page 17. That's the Nigerian News Direct today. Vanguard is next. Um, 7.71 billion Naira rise in Naira value of Forex deposits shoots up money supply. Passi money dominates with 82% share. Analysts blame Forex reform. Others warn 
it may hamper economic growth. So, um, there you go. Out there for you to see. So, uh, let's see, this may also qualify as part of efforts to stabilize the policy. FG to establish Solid Minerals Corporation eyes 50% contribution to GDP. Out there for you. And then above that particular one, Zamfara shots eight cattle markets over insecurity. So that's part of what we're also going to focus on here today, developments in Zamfara and by extension, how it affects different parts of the country. So um, that's just what you get to see. And then let me just add this. Nigerians lack confidence in justice system and be a laments. Oh boy. Okay. That's Vanga this morning. Look at Daily Independence this morning, and it's also talking money in its lead story. Forest liquidity constraints to linger despite reserves boosts. Lead story of Daily Independent newspaper this morning. And of course, the story continues on the inside pages. Right under that picture on the front page is, of course, the story uh, of, of that picture. FG gives illegal miners 30 days to join artisanal cooperatives, says solid minerals will contribute 50% to Nigeria's GDP. Again, it's good to um, underscore the importance of collaboration with states. That conversation needs to happen so we can have a long-term uh, you know, uh, productivity from our solid minerals space worth hundreds of trillions. I'm not sure whether it's even Naira or dollars, but that's what you have on the lead story, on the lead page. Make your pardon, yes, lead page of the Daily Independent newspaper this morning. Right above the nameplate, Huriwa asks Tinubu to deal with naval officers' complicity in crude oil theft. Is that a confirmed story? You may want to find out the details. It continues on the inside pages um, because, of course, we know what uh, the Navy has said about that one and a number of other things that so many people are also saying uh, about that particular story. That's uh, the Daily Independent newspaper this morning. Okay, New Telegraph is next. OPL 245. You're unfit to talk about corruption. Boari tells Adoke. Says, cases ex-AGF cited as reference originated from a government in which he administered justice. So, um, what is it with justice system and the uh, ministers in the temple of justice because earlier there was a which paper was that that talked about i think an mba lamented the nigerians lack confidence in the judiciary uh, but it is lawyers first of all who make up all of that body yeah body and the benches so, so and then this uh, if you could rely on what the president is saying when the agf who's a lawyer himself presided over at the time and then this kind of things happens so um we saw a similar scenario too when a professor was made Minister of Education uh, during um, Kremba, which government now. There was a lot of us to strike and people thought, well, we thought that you were coming with a lot of background information and know-how, uh, institutional memory, how to address all of this, and the rest is, is history. So what goes on when some of these things happen and they're expected to change it? Well, that's what you see here, so who knows? And then, this should be equally interesting, revenue. FG Mall's single window option to block leakages in MDA. So, I know we, we've spoken severally about the single window option with customs, ensuring that the scenario is cleared, so that um, goods are cleared in very quick succession without staying months in the port. So, but this single window, it's, it's about a national single window wherein federal government will automate or digitize, initiate designs to bring greater efficiency in the way the MDAs collect funds. So um, it will be interesting to see how they harmonize all of this and probably 
it may fit into the quest to address what multiple taxation and the likes who knows who knows but that's what you find here that's the telegraph this morning and if we can take a quick look at the Nigerian Tribune on its lead uh, page this morning is also a Buhari story. I was on a rescue mission that's ascribed to the former president, Blasts Adoke, over P and ID Ajaokuta claims and the details of that on page three. And uh, right above the nameplate, FG targets 20 trillion naira annually from tax revenues to review six trillion naira tax incentives given to entities says three billion dollar a fraction bank loan on cause the details of that you'll find on page six of the paper this morning several other stories on the front page for your pick pdb wins edo lg polls as lp apc kick Stories on page 22. 15 LGAs, 224 communities affected, displaced by flood in Niger. And a number of other stories you find interesting right there on the front page. But this is not very pleasant. Many injured as events center collapses on guests in Ekiti. You need to find out what happened there because it is definitely not a pleasant one. And that's the Nigerian Tribune this morning, bringing us to a close of this part of the program where we look at the papers. But there are some issues that you will find very interesting today. So please stay with us. We'll be right back. Thousands of young men and women drawn from the 23 local government areas of Kaduna State converged on the police college in the state capital. The new recruits who were selected from their respective communities after a careful integrity test are here to undergo training preparatory to their enlistment into the Kaduna State Vigilante Service. For a state that has been grappling with insecurity orchestrated by bandits and kidnappers, the presence of the governor, Senator Obasani, at the training ground underscores the importance his administration attaches to the security of lives and properties of residents of Kaduna. We are highly delighted and uh, we wish to applaud you in this giant strike you are taking. I think this is a laudable uh, efforts in view of the numerous security challenges not only in Kaduna State and across Nigeria for the whole globe. The recruitment and screening of the trainees was in collaboration with critical stakeholders, including local government chairmen, traditional and religious leaders. Governor Sani believes this initiative, apart from being a major step towards restoring security and development in Kaduna State, will also provide jobs for the youths. The commencement of this training is a major step toward fulfilling our promise to the good people of Kaduna State. In our administration's blueprint, we are committed to strengthening the manpower and overall operational capacity of countries. I must, however, warn that when you are eventually enlisted into the service and you start carrying out your duties, you must desist from violating the rights of the citizens. Countries were set up to protect the people, not to violate their rights. This personnel injected will definitely improve the security situation in our dear state, Kaduna State. Faced with the challenge of inadequate personnel to successfully wage the battle against bandits and other criminal elements in the communities, the Kaduna State government remains optimistic that the recruitment of these able bodied men and women into the state vigilance service will assist the conventional security agencies with actionable intelligence due to their knowledge of the local environment. Uh, last month, some residents, uh, some terrorists actually, 
abducted eight national youth corps members in Zanfara State. Or they were actually traveling in an AKTC, that's a Quiet Bomb Transport Corporation bus from Uyo to uh, Sokoto, then going through Zamfara when the terrorists attacked and kidnapped them along with the driver. Now uh, we understand that uh, there were eyewitnesses who said that there were actually 11 members, but three of those core members escaped. Then um, at the moment, we understand that uh, some things are being done to see how they can be rescued. But also, uh, in response to that, the Director General of the NYC, Brigadier General Y.D. Amen, has held separate meetings with the heads of security agencies in the state, and that's to discuss with over what can be done, how they can all go ahead and be rescued. So that statement was put out by the NYC themselves. Uh, but this morning, we're joined by Mr. Emmanuel Ete, who is a parent of one of the kidnapped core members. So he's just going to tell us what's been going on, because at the moment, uh, they say, look, they haven't gotten a word. Terrorists don't seem to be talking to the NYC. So, so many people are in the dark about what is going on. Good morning, Mr. Ete. Thank you for joining us today on the program. Yeah, well, it, it appears uh, the connection appears a little weak. We don't know if you can hear me still. It must be very tough and trying times for you and parents of the kidnapped uh, youth corps members. So uh, at the moment, do you have any word from either uh, your ward or even the terrorists or the NYC about the whereabouts of your ward? Okay, I can't seem to hear anything. So, okay, uh, I can't seem to hear anything. We'll sort that at the moment and then bring that back to you. But here in the studio, so I've got uh, Dr. Sani Abdullah Shinkafi, who is the former chairman, Committee on Prosecution of Bandits Related Offenses. Uh, he joins us here. Good morning and thank you for coming on today on the program. Good morning. You know, just trying to imagine what the parents of those kidnapped persons will be going through. It will be a harrowing experience. And, um, just so many questions uh, making the rounds now. Yes, they say the DG of the NYSC has met with uh, several security agencies, uh, Terry, and that you know pretty well. But in terms of how this kind of operations go on, I know you've spoken time and again about this kind of thing. So what is it exactly that we are missing here? How this seem, it still seems to be festering, terrorism, kidnapping, uh, again coming through from Zampara. Uh, it's a terrible uh, situation uh, we are facing in Zamfara and also in the northwestern region. These NYC Corp members were mobilized to Sokoto State for their uh, national mandatory uh, annual uh, national mandatory youth service and uh, on their way in route to Zamfara Highway, they were, their boss were, was intercepted by the terrorists. And uh, three out of the 11 cop members escaped. The, the driver and the eight cop members were taken to the bush, and their vehicle was abandoned. But what I have heard, that the police were able to the vehicle and, and it's now under police custody. So the issue of this banditry, the government or the private government must, must clear a clear state of emergency on security in the west and the northwest region and most especially also in Zamfara. If they do that, what will change? How will it affect anything? You see, there is a lot of uh, root causes of banditry in Zamfara, and there must be a drastic action to make sure that the issue of banditry, terrorism, are being reduced to the barest minimum level.
I have said it time without number. Uh, the military who are in the forefront of uh, the, the fight against terrorists and the criminal element in the country are over streets. They are, they are, they are under-equipped, understaffed, and under-trained. If you look at the total military posts, posts we have in Nigeria, we have not, not, not more than 230,000 put together the military. The Air Force personnel are only up to 18,000, and the Navy, 25,000. If you look at the police which are in charge of maintenance of law and order and internal security, are not are not are just are not up to four hundred thousand. I look at the size of the population, so there is need for for uh, border control. There is porous border. There is high level of corruption in the border. These terrorists cross the border from Niger, Chad to come with the arms and ammunition. So, if I could just understand a little bit more, uh, in other words, you're telling us that. Persons who these terrorists are not entirely Nigerian. Let, let me say that seventy percent of the terrorists are indigenous. Seventy percent. Seventy percent. Then maybe thirty percent are, are, are aliens. If you if you go to if you go to Zamfara, most of the this notorious unbanded campaign were born and brought off. In Zamfara State, each and every local government has their own kimpin, they call it Kachala. In, we have 14 local government. All these 14 local government are under siege of armed bandit. Armed bandit hold the power there. They are more powerful than the local government chairman. They are more powerful than traditional rulers. So, so how is governance going on in the states? The governance is very tedious and uh, very cumbersome because the problem we have faced we are facing in Zampara State, the first unbanditary attacks of unbanditary come in force 2009 in Anka and Maru along the Sadao border. That is the, the, the background of the banditry. So the banditry come up as a result of many factors, there's a lot of root cause of banditry. Corruption on the part of the security, corruption on the part of the judiciary, corruption and extortion from traditional rulers, uh, forest reserves, grazing reserve, cattle root, farm settlement, where, where it, it, it indiscriminately taken over. This is hydro-headed, but in terms of the corruption component, I don't understand it. Is it that what the bandits are bribing police, the, the, judiciary? The, the, what do you if mean today that? a bandit is arrested, maybe the security personnel who arrested the bandit or the vigilante or the locals, they call the NSAT, when they arrested them and take them to, to police, because police are responsible for prosecution, not the army. So when they take them to, when army sometimes arrested this bandit and took them to the police, then before the, the people who arrested this bandit go back home, the bandit may even arrive before them at home. Then there will be a reversal attack. They will revenge. So what? Do there they, will be a counter attack and reversal attack. So what? Do, do they bribe the police to, to get them released or does somebody do it on their behalf? Well, well, I cannot precisely debrief, but I'm telling you that a high level of corruption. Yeah, but uh, what and did you uh, find out? You had a committee that investigated this matter. We what have found see? out that there are some even security personnel, military personnel, who have been compounding this problem. Because some of the rustic cattle, sometimes you see even a, we indicted a military personnel, the rustic cattle, he used to load this rustic cattle and sell it to another livestock market in GVR. It's in the report. 
So, okay. Well, we'll talk about a little bit more. Particularly, you also mentioned the judiciary, several other people, but just a moment. Uh, I understand we do have, uh, we reestablished connection with uh, Mr. Ete, who is a parent of one of the kidnapped uh, youth court members. Mr. Ete, can you hear me now? Okay, good morning, sir. Okay, good morning. So, um, uh, it's really a tough time for you as a parent. I can hear you. Yeah, it's a tough time for you as a parent. We do understand it, along several other parents and the country at large, because nobody wants to be in this kind of situation, not any country, no one whatsoever. But what can you tell us now? Have you gotten any communication from anywhere whatsoever? Well, um, it's very devastating. Because so as a parent, I'm very disappointed by government. No one is talking about or asking questions since this incident happened. Security agencies are not caring. NYC leadership shows no concern. And everyone is behaving as nothing happened. Every activity is going on. And keep on asking, is this the type of government we want to belong or our country? Is this the type of security we can feel safer with. NYC invited these children out of from their homes to Sokoto. And if anything happens, I'm expecting some level of commitment from DG of NYC, which has failed. Nobody cares to call their parents. Nobody discussed about it. After flagging it on the news, everybody went away. And we are here, no communication. We don't see our children. And everybody keeps quiet as if nothing happened. So and sometimes I wonder, and even as security agencies in Safara, what is their obligatory responsibility in such a situation? Because at, as at now, everyone is boiling. People are asking questions. We are expecting the government to act, but they fail. We are expecting a lot of questions, but nobody seems to ask, and nobody seems to address the nation or the parents of what happened. Where about the children? What the government is planning to do, or what they are doing to feed these children? And that's the state we find ourselves now. Well, uh, uh, tough to hear. We, we, Dakar, we did get across to NYC in Zanfar, and then they referred us to the HQ, saying, well, they are the ones who can speak on the matter. But there's also word out there that some sort of ransom is being demanded that they contacted the parent. Did that happen with you, for instance? Are you still there, Ms. Ete? Okay, it looks as if we lost that. So, uh, well, yes. And where are we seeing okay. them? They are not coming. They are not calling. And where are we paying ransom, even if they want us to bring? Hmm. No communication. I I'm sorry, I, I didn't get the initial part of what you were saying. Did they demand ransom from you, the terrorists? Yes, from initial states, they caught them. They demanded a call for ransom. But since that time, they are no more calling, and nobody communicates, and we don't know what to do. Even if we are to pay the ransom, where are we paying the ransom to? And how are we paying it? And we need a government to intervene, to ask questions, but nothing comes up. Well, that's, that's clearly a tough one, but uh, just hang on, Mr. T. But, um, Dr. Sonny, in this, this kind of matters, um, doesn't the state security agencies, don't they have any role? Are they helpless in this kind of matter? Well, the security agencies are not helpless. Uh, during the last administration, I knew what the, gov what the governor did. You know, in this type of situation, you have to apply two parameters, kinetic and non-kinetic approach. If you say you, want, you use total military action to rescue a kidnapped victim, then there's going to be a serious collateral damage. But what I know, uh, there are some repented bandits, some repented bandits, who in this type of situation, if it arose, then the government will now approach them on non-connected approach. Uh, please go and talk to these your people release the social people and the government is not going to pay even a dime as a ransom so a lot of people were scared 
during the last administration would add pay even a penny. But some of them proved so stubborn because some of them, as I have said, are not, are not for example, a state. Yeah, but, but before we talk about the rescue, what about, I mean, is there, what was done when you were there? Because, I mean, the state's authorities know that this is a haven, that anything can happen. Is there no yeah, measure? During, during, was, during the last administration there? of uh, uh, Bello, Dr. Bello Motole, you know he has initiated a peace dialogue. And through that peace dialogue, those who have embraced the dialogue, it is through those who embrace the dialogue, then we now talk to them, we talk to their people. So some of them, through even such situation, they used to even repent and surrender their arms. More than, more than this locally made guns, uh, AK put seven, a lot of arms and ammunition were surrendered by repentant bandits. So in this situation, I don't know the government, the present administration, what they are doing in rescuing uh, this type of uh, situation. Because this is a very devastating situation. It's horrible and terrible situation. Mm. Somebody living from Aqua Ibom in route to Zamfara going to Sokuto for National Youth Service, and their boss is intercepted by terrorists. Uh, it's highly worrisome and yeah, devastating. Absolutely. So anybody who's a parent who parents his children in this situation, it, 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 it's a serious situation and, uh, and, uh, and highly devastating. Mm. Mr. Tay, I know you've spoken about lack of communication on the part of the NYSC on this matter, but could you help us understand this? Was there any advice to your ward in terms of when to travel, when not to travel, and is it true that you know they were traveling at night? Well, um, I might not know what what happened actually when my daughter returned with a call up letter signed by the DG that she was posted to Sokoto. So, um, she went to AATC Park the that same day. Then she was asked to come the next day that all the coppers going to that, that the route that come to Sokoto, there is a bus, they are making arrangement to take them from the park directly to the camp. So they left. She left the house the next morning. Then she kept on, we kept on communicating. So that same man, at night, she told me they were sleeping over, stopped over at Abuja, where they slept the next morning, they took off to Sokoto. So I spoke with her last about 3, a, a, 3 p.m., which uh, the day they left Abuja. From that time, around 5 when I called back, the phone was switched off. So it was a Friday, around 7 p.m., I received a call calling me that had, my daughter was in the apostle. So I tried to call back, the phone was not going. So since that time, the next day, I they called call back again. I spoke with my daughter. So what I told them was I asked her to keep calm. Then I will uh, call them back. From that moment till now, that phone has not gone. And I could not communicate. I've not heard from her. I've not heard from anybody. And the NYC expected some level of commitment, calling parents, telling them, or I, I also expected to address the nation, the state of these children as at now, or what they are doing to free these children. So there's no calls come, nobody cares, and everything seems as nothing happened. So it's worrisome. It's worrisome. All right, uh, well, we'll just uh, go to break now, but we'll come back and get a lot more on this matter. For instance, I mean, for those who may have repented, don't they volunteer information in terms of uh, how people can react, what to do in this circumstance. That's part of what Dr. Shinkafi will be talking to us about when we come back from this break. Stay on with us. Thank you so much for staying with us to having that conversation around security, particularly in the interest of our young in the country. And we've been talking to two gentlemen, but, uh, you know, unfortunately we do not have uh, Mr. Ete, the parent of uh, one of the kidnapped victims. Uh, again, I wanted to even raise an issue about the distance, you know, between 
Kwaibom and Zamfara State. Um, if you do a simple Google search yourself, what you will find will be rather shocking. That it will take you something in the region of 20 hours, more than 20 hours, the shortest distance of three options, more than 20 hours some, in some cases. 17 hours, whatever number uh, you, you you choose, depending on the time of day that that, that you are you are going, but the, the kind of vehicle you're using, uh, the kind of uh, the time of day that you are traveling, and all those things, and so those are issues that are in consideration there and one is wondering if it wouldn't be a good idea for the uh, NYSC for instance to take charge of commuting these children across the country because I mean look at this uh, situation that we've put these parents who have no duty being in the kind of situation that they have found themselves now. And let's just hope that with all of these conversations that we are having indeed, that parents are getting some feedback from the authorities as we speak. Because unless that is happening, uh, I'm wondering if there is anything that we are doing here that we couldn't have done better. But let me come back to you, uh, Mr. Shinkafi. You know, sitting as chair of that committee on prosecution of bandits related offenses uh, in Zamfara State, I don't know if you can tell us what are the things you found out as causes. Now, that may sound trite, it may sound stale, it may sound like we've been talking about it forever, but perhaps that will also give some sense to people about what is happening. Are the causes political? Are they economic? Or are they uh, what uh, you know the police has once called commercial criminality? Well, let me correct you. I'm, I'm not the substantive chairman of the committee for now. And the former chairman committee on prosecution and bandit and bandit-related offenses. So uh, that is that's the situation now. I'm not the present chairman, and I don't know who is the chairman now, but I'm the former chairman of the prosecution and bandit-related offenses in Zampara State under the administration of Dr. Bello Matola Marado, who is now the present Minister of State for Defense. So the root causes of a banditry in Zampara State, uh, it has a lot of uh, components. And uh, initially or historically, banditry started from uh, herds, uh, herders and the farmers' clashes and turned to cattle rustling metaphors to cattle rustling, and also at the bands to kidnapping or ransom, killing, displacement of uh, innocent people from their ancestral homes, and uh, rapes and um, uh, um, um, robbery. But uh, there's a lot of causes. Uh, indiscriminate allocation of forest reserves, games reserve, grazing area, cattle, uh, uh, cattle routes, and there's higher level of corruption in the judiciary among the security agencies and the extortion of the Spulanis by the traditional rulers. There's forest, forest border, there's a lack of uh, border control, uh, there is illegal immigrant that who are not Nigerians who have used who have joined banditry. So in a nutshell, banditry is a criminal enterprise where a lot of people come together to commit a crime as armed bandits. Armed bandits doesn't have any ideology. They don't promote any ideology like Iswap, Obo, Koharam, but they are terrorists and criminals. So the problem why the unbanditry in Zamfara State has not ended, there are a lot of uh, reasons. 
There is no sustainability in the fight against crime and criminality in Zampara State. Sometimes the military will do, like Air Force, will do a hit and withdraw approach. When they attack a camp or they hide out of armed bandit, today they won't come back till after maybe three months, five months, even a year. And all these forty local government in Zamfara State are under siege of armed bandit and headed by a kimpin, which they call Kachala. And all this they had out during the MD Guso committee for finding lasting solution to armed banditry were able to identify their hideout and their camps and their leaders. And we handed over this report to the state government and we handed over the list of this hideout to Air Force and the military. But the military in Zamfara said are overstretched. They are on or they are on their train, on their staff, on their equipped. And the terrain there also is all conducive, no accessibility, no access road. So and the, even some of the traditional rulers, because Zampara State is also a state where it has been there's a population of traditional rulers. It is in, it's, it's only in Zampara State we have 19 emirs, more than 278 or 300 district head, more than 1,000 village head. So some of these traditional rulers were indicted for aiding and abetting ambanditry in our committee reports. So there's a lot of uh, root cause uh, that if the government is ready, to fight this uh, armed bandit, there must be a total military uh, uh, this thing, oppression against this armed bandit. Both the arm, uh, army oppression, both the police oppression, both the air force oppression. So there must be a combined oppression and there must be a synergy among the, the, the security agencies. And they have to shun away the, 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 the interagency robbery to achieve this, this thing. Mm. Sometimes the, the, the DSS will do intelligence gathering and give to action agencies. And this agency will not act within the, the time frame. Mm. So, well, Mr. Shinkafi, uh, I'm, I'm happy that you are able to, you know, tell us, you know, the background and then the where the challenges are. So essentially, with the report that you've given to the state government at the time, and these issues that you have raised about a lack of cooperation among the security agencies, uh, are you by any chance saying that lack of action is a deliberate activity or attempt by us as a people, without mentioning any specific agency now, to actually perpetrate this crime as opposed to making sure it doesn't continue? Because that's the way it sounds. Well, you see the, you see the military force, that is the army who are in the forefront of the fight against uh, the bandit in Zamparase, is overstretched. If you look at the total, total military personnel in Nigeria, they are not up to 240 personnel. Well, well, put, put pardon me, uh, Mr. Shinkafi. Air Shinkafi. Force, Navy, yeah, and the me. Army. J just a are second. Up to two, 300 but, but my, my apologies. My apologies. Then if you look at the also police. Exactly. Police, 400 yeah. personnel. Mm -hmm. Just a second. So on what that I'm trying to tell you that. that you just raised, on the issue of police that you just raised, it is the, prim the primary responsibility of police is not to fight crime but to prevent crime. That underscores what you mentioned the other time about intelligence gathering, to prevent these things from happening. How come we are still in the space of fighting something we could have prevented? What, in your opinion, is responsible for this lack of uh, cooperation or collaboration among the security agencies? Well, you see, police, they have a department called counter-terrorism. So that counter-terrorism sometimes and the mob mobile police 
force used to join to do a joint operation tax force. And uh, if you look at the, 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 the total numbers of security personnel in Zamfarase put together, they are understaffed and they, they are under equipped and under trained. So this is the point I'm trying to, to raise. And you know, like Shinkapi, where I come from, and the Zulmi local government share border with the Niger Republic. So there is population of small and lighter arms into, into Zampara State through the land border. Well, Mr. Shikapi, and the part of the part of the go ahead, please go ahead. Part of the uh, uh, constitutional responsibility of the military, in accordance with the section. 217 subsection 1 that the Nigerian armed forces are charged with the responsibility of protection of territorial integrity in our land border, in the sea, also on the airspace. So this forest border border crossing, the, 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 the immigration and the customs. One of them even are also aiding and abetting this banditry because of the high level of corruption in the border. Well, Mr. So these are the problems. Yes. Also, you see, Sokoto share boundary with the Niger Republic, mm. Kebi share boundary with the Niger Republic, mm. and Kasina share boundary with the Niger Republic. And this is one of the epic center. Mm. Well, this also banditry. raises another and, question. And, and let me let me let me be let me be let me very specific to you. Okay. Zampara is the epic center of banditry, but banditry in the northwest. All these five states, Kasina, Kebi, Sokoto, Kaduna, and uh, and the Zamfara state in the northwest, including Niger state, we share one route, Niger state. This band, this this stage state are under siege. Last Friday, worshippers were attacked in a mosque. Several worshippers were killed in Saya Saya in Ikra local government in Kaduna state. Hmm. Well, so, Mr. So the, I'm calling Mr. President to to declare. Set of emergency on security. Well, most certainly, so many, in, so many in, in issues to raise in the conversation that you're having with us this morning. But how do you respond to this all also? Uh, not too long ago, we heard, you know, from the Minister of uh, Defense that mining activities is also a reason fueling insecurity in the Northwest. Some say that because of the multi-billion Naira uh, illegal or legal mining activities going on in Zamfara State, that uh, some of these insecurity issues are supposed to divert attention from the real criminality, which is this illegal mining. mining. Is that something you can confirm in any way, manner, shape or form? Well, illegal mining contributed to the insecurity in Zampara State. But the illegal miners were banned from mining for the, by the last administration since, 20, to, since 2019. The real miners who have license, who have mining lease, were banned from mining, were suspended. The mine activity was suspended by the last administration. But the, now the bandit who are in the hideout Look at the advantage of the ban. And the bandits also engage in illegal mining with the foreigners. People from Burkina Faso, from Mali, from Chad, took over this site. But when the legal miners are mining in their site before the ban, they used to seek for security protection in their mining site. But now the burning activities who are the legal miners abandon their site and their site were taken over by these bandits in collaboration with the foreigners. Mm. So okay. that is why I'm, 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 I'm also blaming immigration for, for, for liberation of these immigrants. Mm. All right. Well, into, into Nigeria. Yes, we, we we've since uh, had uh, Mr. Emmanuel Lete back, who is a parent of uh, one of the kidnapped uh, co-members. Um, Mr. Lete, again, uh, since uh, uh, 
I don't know. I don't even know how to feel about you know what you're saying. I mean, to us so far. But I mean, you said you haven't heard anything from uh, any security agency so far. I'm just wondering. Can you confirm whether or not are you in touch with other parents or guardians of other core members who are in the same space as you? Are you hearing anything from them? Is there anyone speaking to any one of them that you may or may not be aware of? I say, take, can you hear me? So, that will be difficult for now. So, I didn't quite, quite catch uh, much of what you said. Could you please go again? Oh, yeah, the network is not very. Uh, friendly to us, but uh, Mr. Ite, it will be good to, if you can, uh, just make the effort as you are. Well, I mean, we really do sympathize with you and other parents. I'm just wondering if other parents have been contacted by anyone at all, be it the kidnappers, the uh, authorities, the NYC, anyone at all, it will be helpful to know if that is happening. All right, well, let's, let's come back to you, uh, Mr. Shinkafi. So this situation right now that you are, I mean, you are, we're, we're talking about this kidnapping thing, uh, it's not the first time. It's been happening over and over again. I mean, you, you've also spoken to some of these things, and it will seem like uh, insecurity is manifesting itself in different ways, manners, shapes, and forms. And, but, you know, the most troubling of all of these for me, is what you said about us having information that a crime would be committed and no one does anything about it timelessly. At whose desk do we put this particular information? Well, the, you know, after the compilation of our report, the report was handed over to the governor and the mm -hmm. governor will have made some recommendations and the former governor have, have taken steps to, 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 uh, to implement the recommendations. Some of the traditional rulers were indicted in that effort. Some were dethroned and taken to court. And also, the, from 1999 to 2019, all the land allocated, the palm lands, the grazing reserve, the poorest reserve, the cattle route, which were indiscriminately uh, allocated by the traditional ruler, all the land were revoked by the, by, the, by, the, by the previous administration. It's one of the measures. And also the governor come out with the, uh, this dialogue. Some of the notorious bandits were able to repent and surrender their arms and ammunition, and they were reintegrated into the society. But with the present situation now, there's a serious resurgence of this uh, unbanditry and other criminal element in the state. So what this administration is doing, I'm not part of it, and I cannot uh, only believe for the governor or neither for the commissioner or security. But all the reports we have handed over to the government and governor have done a lot to address the issue. Right. The major problem we have faced in Zampara State, most of the politicians are toying with the lives of the innocent people, playing politics with the unbodied or insecurity. Okay. In this last election, there's a lot of uh, this campaign of colony on this issue of insecurity. All right, just one more, pardon me, we'll, we'll just one more thing before we go, uh, to wrap up on this matter. Uh, if you can make it brief, that would be nice. Now, for those you say repented, terrorists that repented while you were in office. Don't they volunteer information in terms of the mode of operation of terrorists such that when cases like this happen, security agencies know how to respond? Does that happen? Who did they pass information to? Are you aware of any? Well, the repented bandit, I know, 
uh, the, the Fraser government says not going to go into any peace dialogue with the bandit. What about the former government? But the former, the former governor has gone into dialogue. If this type of situation happened, we used to reach out to this repented bandit, and this repented bandit will work with security agencies to either rescue them or to also uh, collect them from their captors. Okay. Yeah. And without right. paying any ransom. Without so, paying ransom. Without paying ransom. Okay. Yes. Well, but, but, you, um... but this administration, uh, I'm telling you, many people were killed. Many people were kidnapped. All right. More than 2,000 people were killed and kidnapped. Not well, any place in Zampara, any fourteen local government is safe. So I'm we'll, calling we'll, on the leadership um... of NYIC to stop posting youth cop members to Sokoto, KB, Ibn Zamfara. Well, this is going to hit at the heart of the NYSC, how they handle this particular matter, because it's a very, very serious matter in Thailand. They need to also communicate to the parents if they haven't done that, because you just heard one of the parents say, no word from the core. And um, we'll also keep trying to get across to the government and the governor to see what their response will be on this matter and security generally moving forward. But we have to thank you for coming on this morning. Sani Abdullah Shinkafi, former chairman, Committee on Prosecution of Bandits Related Offenses. We will be back in just a moment. Stay on with us. Thank you for staying with us. Just before we get into that conversation, let's remind you of something that started in 1981, which the Lagos State Government is finally uh, crescendoing today. Uh, we'll bring you more details on that as time goes on. But as you've seen right there, uh, Mr. Dr. Austin Tamjo joins us this morning to have a conversation around FG's policies to revamp the economy, assess governance across states, and to strengthen uh, inter-ethnic relations in the country. He is former Commissioner for Information in River State. Thank you so much for joining us. This Thanks morning. for having me. Um, no doubt. A good number of people have been talking about the federal government's policies and depending on whose side you're on or what side of the divide you find yourself, um, opinions are as divided. What do you make of those uh, f federal government's policies to start with? Well, uh, you know, the, the campaigns are over now. The, the government is in place. The cabinet um, has been formed. Um, so we, we can't uh, be talking about um, promises anymore. This is exactly the phase uh, when, when campaign promises must now be implemented. Um, the, the Tinubu campaign had um, a slogan, uh, Renewed Hope. Uh, so at this point, after the elections have been conducted and the campaigns are over, actual governance begins. And so what Nigerians are expecting at this point in time is how we need to trans, you know, transition from, from slogans, campaign slogans, you know, to make renewed hope, you know, um, an actionable governance doctrine. So, for instance, Nigerians will be looking for what renewed hope means in education. As on a sector-by-sector -sector basis, what does it mean in education? And I imagine that, you know, uh, renewed hope in education should mean increased access to, to education, uh, completely rethinking our educational infrastructure to make sure and that the president works with state governors to completely rethink, you know, the emphasis on credentialism and certification, how do we make sure we'll bring back, you know, skill acquisition into the debate so that when people leave school, they are not looking to get jobs, but they are looking to create jobs for themselves and to create jobs for others. So we want to also see, for instance, what renewed hope means, you know, in the power sector, what it has to mean, you know, as an actionable doctrine, 
has to be to increase access to power supply, un uninterrupted power supply, so that the productive um, base of the economy will have power in order to work um, and create jobs. Uh, what does renewed hope mean in um, healthcare delivery? What it has to mean um, if you really want to change the material circumstances of our people is to make sure uh, there's, impro there's improvement in primary healthcare delivery system across the country. He, the president has to work very closely with the state government because, uh, as you know, in the final analysis, um, the over 200 million Nigerians that we have are scattered in all the 36 states of the Federation. So the president cannot do it alone. He has to work in close synergy. Um, with the state governments and, um, and the local governments. So what does renewed hope mean um, in practical, actionable terms? I think that's what Nigerians will be looking out for. And I'm actually very glad that you started by talking about the need, the, the, how crucial it is for the federal government and the states to collaborate, without which we will not at all have the kind of um, impact that we, we desire to have. Uh, the federal government, for instance, one of the programs that has already been declared is food security, uh, an emergency in the food security sector. And it definitely spoke about uh, areas in which the federal government will purchase or acquire you know, property or landed property from the state to conduct these uh, you know, programs and all of those things. And then, of course, in that same space, he's talked about a palliative distribution to the states, five billion each in uh, cash and in kind and all of those things. But, you know, that collaboration, how strong would you say it has been historically? Mm. And what must change now mm. to make it as strong and as effective as it ought to be? Because, I mean, we all know what has happened in the palliative distribution, for instance. Once you hear palliatives, the mind of many goes back to 2020 and the things that happened at the time. Mm. And then, so, but generally, in terms of collaboration, how strongly do you think they have been over the years, particularly in terms of legislation, and actual implementation. Historically, the, the collaboration hasn't hasn't been good. As you know, during the Buhari administration, for instance, uh, there was a great deal of discussion about palliatives, especially during the, the COVID-19 crisis. And what we found, especially at the level of the states, um, was very pathetic, very unacceptable. Um, you know, if you want to be blunt about this, uh, frankly, you, you, there is hardly any kind of administrative or legislative oversight that happens at the level of the states. Um, I'm afraid that you can't expect politicians to hold themselves to account. You will have to find a way to work with the legislature to make sure that there is legislative oversight. Uh, but unfortunately, across the spectrum, we haven't seen that kind of, um, you know, legislative um, oversight. So you, the governors are basically left to their devices. Um, and, and unfortunately, um, you know, civil society is fragmentary and weak in this country to the point where, you know, civil oversight is, all, is not also strong. So what I would suggest is we are talking about a new dispensation. Um, is for the president to make it a very clear, send a strong signal to the state governors that look, you know, you have direct administrative jurisdiction over the states. Um, and so the policies of the federal government will have to find practical resonance on the ground in your states. And I can't do this without your buying. So you have to make sure you drive this process. I think um, palliatives, um, you know, should be understood in a much more complex way sim uh, than simply, you know, um, distributing bread and beans, you know, in local governments, um, mainly to party faithfuls. Uh, I think that when we are talking about palliatives this time, um, it should be institutionally guided. Um, in most states, you know, the ministries of social uh, welfare are not very strong. So maybe we have an opportunity now in the final analysis to make sure that we institutionalize the distribution of these palliatives. I would personally prefer that the palliatives are not sent in the form of food because that's not sustainable. We've, we've seen that repeatedly across history. So what I think is that the palliatives, 5 billion naira 
um, I understand that they, they, are, they are about to send to the states, um, should be invested in primary health care delivery systems, should be invested in education, should be invested in visible um, sustainable uh, projects rather than simply, you know, um, given a few packets of, um, of, of, um, of bees and, um, and, the, and the noodles to, to families, which as well as we've seen are, are not sustainable. But what I think um, I need to emphasize is that the, the governors must be brought, you know, to take responsibility for the administration of their states. Um, I have been in government and I can tell you um, that there is very little oversight um, that happens at the state level. And I think that that has to change. But if it doesn't change, uh, the very best intentions of Mr. President may not find actual manifestations on the ground in the states. And I think sometimes we, we get it wrong by placing disproportionate amount of attention um, to the federal government without, without realizing that the state governors actually have direct administrative responsibility for the people that live um, in those states. And so the states remain, you know, a very weak link in terms of execution of impactful projects. So now that we have a new set of governors, uh, except those who are returning, um, and we also have a new president whose um, ad administrative doctrine is based on renewed hope as i said in the beginning we need to find this renewed hope um completely rethinking our approach to sectoral delivery systems um you mentioned um you know uh, healthcare delivery you know primary healthcare delivery is the closest primary healthcare is the closest you know pair of um, healthcare delivery system to the people. Um, you know, before you move to the secondary and the tertiary, we need to find a way to make sure that there are, there are impactful policies that can change the material lives of our people. Nigerians are going through a lot, and, and, and I think that the expectations are very high. Uh, you know, this government cannot afford to drop the ball. Hmm. And, and I think there's a commitment to, 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 to change things on the ground. Allow me to stay with the state's conversation for a bit. Um, um, and I'll give you a few instances to which you can um, speak. Um, we once interviewed uh, an ex-governor of your state, uh, Governor Wiki, and uh, one of the things that we asked him was, look, how come uh, when the uh, intervention projects of the NDDC are going to happen in uh, oil developing, oil producing states, that you know, the governors are not aware. I mean, isn't there supposed to be some kind of carry along system where you don't go into a state to execute any project without the state, without carrying the state government along? And of course, he talked about the fact that that conversation doesn't really happen. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, you just also cited it, the fact that when things are coming from the federal government to the states, uh, a good number of times the states, rather than take initiative and actually do what is expected, they kind of politicize it. An example is what's on the front page of the Daily Times newspaper this morning, where uh, Adamawa residents are alleging a fraud in rebranding foodstuff with the photographs of the governor and accuse him of vendetta. Of course, the governor uh, hasn't said anything you know to that and that's just two of several examples uh, in the previous administration we had a situation where the federal government said in collaboration with the states we're going to pull a hundred million nigerians out of poverty we know whether or not that has happened so in terms of this collaboration is it the legal instrument that is missing the political will that is missing or the supervision what exactly is it that is making that collaboration difficult or not happen? I think the structures of accountability, uh, you know, in this country are simply weak. You know, that's, that's just a fact. Um, concerning the NDDC um, collaborating with states, I mean, I, there is really nothing wrong with that. But, you know, as you, as you probably know, the NDDC itself has been over-politicized um, to the point where you, you would have expected, you know, those who have technical competence, you know, that's it. That's an intervention agency, you know. So you would have expected those who have technical competence to head it, to set the developmental agenda for the region and, and, and drive the process. But what, what we've seen, especially in the past eight years, you know, has been a situation where people are just randomly selected, um, you know, and put in the board. And then those who are appointed tend to be 
um, of different political tendencies uh, to to those um, to the governors who administer the state. So I, I, my hope, frankly, um, is that this this is going to change in this new administration. A board has just been set up. There, there should be no difficulty. I mean, if development is the single agenda of of these agencies and the state governments, there should be no difficulty at all um, in these parties collaborating to drive development in order to the door of the people. Um, so as I said, we need to see how renewed hope works, um, especially uh, now that we have so many um, unemployed people uh, in the country. Um, there, there is talk of um, uh, some debate about um, <laughs> the percentage of those who are unemployed in this country. In 2002, in 2020, the National Bureau of Statistics you know, put out uh, the numbers and said, um, over 33 per, uh, percent of Nigerians were unemployed. Uh, but now, I think two weeks ago, we now have new figures coming from the, the NBS uh, suggesting that uh, you know they are they are rebasing the statistical metrics uh, for for calculating unemployment. And we now have uh, 4.1 people unemployed in this country. How do you feel about I, that? I, I think I think that this is a very dangerous trend. The NBS is a very highly respected, very vital, strategic national institution. Um, you don't fight unemployment by creating statistical debates. Uh, what we should be looking at is a situation where we recognize that we have a lot of young people who are unemployed. Um, and the government, you know, the president has made it very clear that he's not looking at statistics so much. He's looking at how to create employment. He, the president, at least from, as, as I understand it, the president appears to have a keen awareness of the kind of unemployment crisis that we face. And um, he's made, made that very clear that he's going to make um, employment provision a very key target of his administration. The government cannot do it alone. I, I presume they will work with the with enterprising Nigerians and the private sector. Mm -hmm. The finance minister, you know, in his uh, uh, first uh, press briefing, also placed a very important emphasis on job creation. So, I think that the, the the folks at the MBS should be very careful, you know, not to create an unnecessary statistical debate about unemployment. The unemployment figures they are presenting are not only ironic. Uh, but laughable because it suggests that Nigeria has far more employed people than France. You know, so these things are, these, these things can, in the final analysis, actually erode the, the kind of credibility that oh. the MBS has always been. Uh, be known for. So my suggestion would be for those folks at the MBS to be very careful and not take political sycophancy to, to the MBS or politicize the National Bureau of Statistics because that's a very strategic national institution. The, the, the figures that they put there are supposed to be believable and close as possible to reality. Um, the figures that come from the MBS are used as a basis for policy formulation, not only by government here in the country, but also by investors. So we have to be very careful not to politicize such a very serious public institutions. Hmm. Well, um, Dr. Tamjo, just one moment. Let's uh, go back to 42 years ago when the conversation around what the Lagos State government at the time called the Metroland project uh, began, but now it seems to have come to a head. Our correspondent, uh, Dari Do, is right uh, there on the field and at the location of where they launch the official commencement of the Lagos Blue Rail Line will kick off from today. Well, Dari, if you can hear me, um, What's the update? Can you give us a quick uh, background? You know, how far so far? What are we looking forward to today, uh, particularly about this Lagos Rail Mass Transit program? Hi, yo. I can hear you clearly, and I can tell you that the day is here. Any moment from now, the governor of Lagos State will be here to take this particular ride. You can see. The train is set, or the trains are on the track, ready. This is the exact um, station where the then president, Muhammad Buhari, was. He launched this particular project in January. And what we're expecting today is that the governor will take this inaugural ride from the marina station to mile two. Uh, we don't know 
how far, we don't know how long that would take us, but it's a 13-kilometer uh, ride. Um, let me give you a bit of a background, just like you have asked. D downstairs, are, there's a whole lot of activities, drumming, dancing, a lot of officials waiting for the governor to come. And when he comes, of course, they've spoken a lot about the processes of getting um, on board this particular train. When you're going to come in as a commercial passenger, there are processes, you get the carry card, you, you, you use the carry card. Once you're done with that, you gain access into this particular uh, platform we are at this moment, and you'll be able to take this train. One key part of this entire pro, uh, project is the fact that this train will run on electricity. And there are two questions, especially the key one is about safety. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, quickly right now. Uh, if you see, normally most of the trains, especially the one we're having at the moment from Lagos to Ibadan, which is a federal project, runs on uh, the DM, what they call the DMU. But this is a different one. It's going to run on electricity. And the tracks you're seeing at the moment, that is why you have an extra uh, rail. It uses a third rail, and that is where the train will generate its uh, power from when we move. But I need to say, say this. Um, clearly, uh, Lamata mentioned, the Lamata boss mentioned, that this particular ride and subsequent ride in the coming weeks will be on locomotive, not on this particular, not on, um, on electricity just yet. Uh, what you are seeing at the moment is the completion of the first phase which is the 13 kilometers. Once they are done, they said, once they are done with the 27 kilometers, with all the infrastructure, with all the independent uh, uh, grid that will supply this, then the train will be able to run with full capacity, which is expected to convey about 500,000 people uh, daily, and will be able to run on electricity IO. Well, uh, you, you've uh, started us out, Dari, on a very uh, aspirational note. It will run on electricity. And you raised a very vital concern of safety. How about security? Because the sustainability of this project is also something that people should talk about. I mean, if anything happens to the electricity infrastructure, most certainly it's worrisome, don't you think? Um, uh, the Lagos State government, uh, in some of the information or the communication they've been putting out in the past couple of days, they've mentioned the fact that they would have security in place um, on uniformed men and they would use the Lagos State um, neighborhood watch men. They would be on ground at every station. Aside that, one key part, the safety part, is that they've cut in up. There's a, there's a fence around the facility, which is, uh, of course, you and I know, 700 votes, 750 votes. It's a high voltage, and they've been, uh, there's been a lot of advocacy going out there to warn people against crossing the tracks. They said there will be 300 cameras across the facilities, the terminals, the train stations, the tracks, just to make sure that they monitor everything. Then the track, they said there will be 30 cameras on the tracks just to make sure that they monitor activities, you know, vandals and all sorts. Even with the construction of the facility that we've seen, there's been some obstruction, there's been some destruction in the past, and they're trying to guide against this. It's not only the fact that vandals can um, create something dangerous for the public, they can also arm themselves going close to this track. It's a different ball game. It's different. It's the first of its kind in Nigeria. Lagos, we haven't seen anything like this before, and that's because of the fact that the rail tracks will be on high voltage and they've been trying to send out a communication to the public just to make sure that they are fully aware of the danger. Although it's, it remains to be seen if all this information or the communication the Lagos State government has been putting out are enough to um, at least guide the public against all the danger that they've been warning against Ayo. Well, that's certainly uh, something concerning, I mean, particularly given the information that you're also confirming to us now. I'm also very excited about what you mentioned when you talked about the carry cards, or is it carry coin? I don't know which one it is. Particularly because uh, the, the national rail system, uh, people still have to use cash only to board um, wherever you go. But now you're saying it is purely electronic? Exactly how is that happening? No cash transactions, just carry cards? Help educate us further. 
Okay, I'll, I'm going to start by explaining how, how much this would cost. If you're trying to take a full-length ride of this train, say from um, Marina to Maltu, it's going to cost you 750 uh, Naira. Then the Lagos states where the pilot uh, in place, they've slashed the price by 50%. So you're paying around 750, uh, 7, uh, 375 Naira. So what you will need to do is you obtain a card. You can load the card. It's just like your credit card. You can load it. Have money ready in your card. Anytime you are ready to take, the car, to take a ride, you go to the train station. That is your access card. Once you have your card loaded, once you have money on it, you're able to take the ride from any spot. And that is how it's going to work. As we're coming in, we got a lot of um, uh, the, 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 the salesperson downstairs trying to sell the car to us. And that's the process. Uh, do you want to buy a card? And they were asking if we're going to buy the car to have access uh, to this. But you and I know that this is a special day. They're expecting the governor to come around. And a lot of people will take a ride with the governor. So I assume that today will be a different day. There will be a lot of access. Many journalists, many officials of the state and invited guests would have that on, on in that access. They won't have to get the carry card. But from tomorrow or any other time you're trying to take this ride, this 13 kilometer ride, you would need the carry card, which will grant you access. You won't even get to this point that I'm standing at the moment if you don't have that card, Ayo. Hmm. Well, it's very exciting to hear, Dari. I mean, most certainly it's something every Lagosian should look uh, forward to. Uh, as unbelievable as it sounds, it is finally happening 42 years after it was initiated. At what time is that exactly is it supposed, uh, this commission is supposed to happen? We're expecting the governor anytime soon? Um, the, the, the time stated was 9 a.m. Uh, we're expecting the governor. Of course, uh, downstairs, uh, we will be able to show that in our subsequent crossings, uh, a lot of officials are already there waiting for the governor. And once the, once the governor uh, comes, uh, we expect him to uh, come to this particular point. And if you can see the train in the background, that is the uh, train right there. A lot of officials are already uh, also on standby. Uh, the, the process is taking this right before, of course, uh, during the um, inspection tour, uh, there was a, a facility launch and there was eventually uh, the official launch of this project, at, at least the first, the first one from Marina to Malzu. So once the governor comes uh, with all his officials and everyone would expect that it will go, come straight to this particular platform. Um, get on board and we'll go on that ride. Of course, we'll be bringing you all, all the updates. I also have my colleague uh, at Mal2, who is also on standby, uh, eventually would also give you all the updates, what's happening there uh, with, uh, with, with this particular launch at IO. Thank you so much, Dari. We'll most certainly uh, keep everyone informed about this. It is the first of its type in Nigeria, and it has finally happened. Thank you so much, Dari, for a wonderful reporting there. Well, that's uh, Dari Du, our correspondent, bringing you live updates about the Lagos Rail Mass Transit happening finally after so many years. Well, Dr. Tam George, that is definitely the kind of thing. Um, you're, you're looking very excited yourself. Yeah, you know, any time there is uh, many developments happening that will directly benefit the people, mm. um, you know, I'm very much in support of it. In fact, as I was looking at um, his presentation on the screen, I was, I was just reminiscing, you know, on um, my experience with rail transport system in, in Barcelona in 2011. Mm. You know, we need this kind of, you know, mass transit system that can move the largest amount of people at a time from one location to the other it will create economic opportunities it will make people you know find it easier to move within the city and sometimes those who are you know transporting a farm produce you know from one location to the other will get to the markets faster so this kind of you know you know infrastructural development that can have direct impact on commerce and general commercial mobility is very exciting indeed mm. and we, we want to see more of this happening across the country you know um this rail line that we're talking about is going to traverse 
quite a number of local governments, Good. no doubt. And it, it brings to mind uh, one of the stories on the front pages of one of the papers this morning, where CSOs and lawyers are asking the federal government to disburse resources directly to the local government authorities. You know, it's an, on the front page of this Nigerian newspaper this morning. And they berated the governors for all of that. And of course, you are not unaware that a good number of state governors uh, have always opposed this. Uh, speak to us about your experience, particularly when you were in government. Mm -hmm. how uh, easy or not it is to engage local government authorities and rather activate local government authorities to work on their own by themselves the way we had it in the First Republic, mm. the Second Republic, and the Third Republic. Mm. How, why why well, is it it's, difficult? It's, it's interesting that you ask this question because, you know, <laughs> ironically, one of the major arguments, you know, for the creation of local governments uh, was the recognition that this is a terror of government, you know, that is closest to the people. And so there were so many agitations for the creation of local governments um, in order to drive development closer to the doors of the people. Uh, but these local governments, especially over the past um, um, 10, 15 years or so, have been emasculated. Um, you know, a lot of their funds have uh, been been diverted by the state government. This is no secret. I mean, this is happening all over the all over the the, the country. Um, so, if they don't have direct funding going to the local governments, and the local governments are then able to, you know, use these these resources you know, in a way that will have direct impact on the people. Of course, development is going to fail, and that is what we've seen all across the country. But there are two things here to consider. The first is that there has to be a strong insistence, you know, from the center, from the federal government to make sure that not only are these monies disbursed directly to the local governments, but that there must be an accounting process to make sure that these monies, when they get to the local governments, are not diverted by the state governors. The, go the president has got to make sure working with the accountant general of the federation and other state institutions at the center mm -hmm. must make sure that these these disbursed funds are, are carefully monitored and that they get to their actual destinations mm -hmm. now when they get to the local governments there has to be a, a completely separate accounting process to make sure that these funds are actually disbursed in a way that benefit the people so unfortunately what we've seen is that you know along the, 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 the spectrum I just laid out. You know, we have very weak oversight happening, you know, from the center out to the state level. So when it gets to the states, you know, even when the funds are diverted, we, we see that very little eventually trickles down to the local governments. And when they, even the little that gets to the local governments, you know, nobody is actually held you know, accountable for the, 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 the use of these funds. Do they have development projects? Do they have a development agenda? We don't see these things. So there is a massive, a massive dysfunction in the oh. system. And I think that, I think that the, 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 the new administration, the president appears to be, to be very aware of this. And I, and I hope we'll see a change. But I can tell you over the past decade or so, you know, it's been a complete failure of the local government administrations, and the state governors are directly responsible for this failure. Particularly coming at a time when we saw one governor in the southwest uh, receiving adulation, so to speak, from local government chairmen, literally bowing to him to do the needful for them. But you know, this is our conversation for another day, and so mm -hmm. many other things to raise with you, mm -hmm. Dr. Austin Tam George. Unfortunately, we are completely <laughs> out of time. We have to let you go. Mm -hmm. Dr. Austin Tam George is former commissioner for information in River State. Once again, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thanks for having me. <laughs> well, your own contribution to the program. Let's begin with your Stretchville. It says, it's good to know that the Lagos Rail Mass Transit will be commencing today. However, we hope they will maintain it and keep it consistent as it will be using electricity. It should not end like the BRT that are not maintained and consistent. Well, this email is from Babangida Yunus who says he's advising the NYSE to stop sending youth corps members to Zamfara State for safety reasons. And then another email on the same matter. No, yeah, uh, this is from Prince Adi. He says the fundamental of the problem of banditry in Zamfara State is illegal gold mine activities. All right, so there you go. That is the show today. We thank you all for watching. We'll get to hear from several other perspectives on the same matter and more. So 
just uh, keep it locked here at channels. We'll see you next time. I'm Chamberlain, so goodbye. Have a wonderful day and a productive week. I'm Ayo Makinde. Bye for now.